There are some people in this world who just have an absolute heart of gold. People who have so much to give and ask for so little in return. Those people who you feel lucky to even be around because you know that they would do anything for you. But sometimes, these are the people who get taken advantage of by the most selfish, narcissistic, or outright evil people. People who will just use that love that the other person has to offer and take so, so much until there is nothing left to give. That is what happened to Maria Munoz. She was the light in the lives of so many people who knew her until one man came in and much like a life-sucking leech, he took everything Maria had until it was too late for her to get out. This is the tragic, devastating story of Maria Munoz. Maria Munoz was originally from Puerto Rico and she was known as being a kind soul with the biggest heart. She had the brightest smile and she was someone that anyone could rely on for love and support. While still living in Puerto Rico, she worked as a nurse and it was at her job as a nurse where she met a man named Joel Peyote who was 11 years older than her. He was a nursing student at the time, and when Maria met Joel, he was very family-oriented. He was intelligent and a hard worker. Those are qualities that made Maria fall in love with Joel. The two went on to start dating, and by 2011, they were married. Shortly after marrying, the couple moved to Laredo, Texas. There, Joel got a job as a Certified Registered Nurse Anesthetist, or CRNA. A CRNA helps provide certain drugs that are used to help patients with pain or staying asleep during surgery. They help with administering these meds and monitoring the patient before, during, and after surgical procedures. This was a dream job for Joel. He loved his work and was absolutely dedicated to being the best nurse possible. After getting married, the couple went on to have two sons. At the time of her death, 31-year-old Maria was the mother to 5-year-old Alejandro and her almost 2-year-old Valentino. After having her sons, Maria decided to stay at home full-time to be a stay-at-home mom. Maria was known to absolutely adore her two little boys, always taking them to the park to play and reading to them before bed every night. She was an absolutely dedicated mother. While being a stay-at-home mom, Maria picked up piano as a hobby. But as much as she loved being a stay-at-home mother, she did always have plans of going back to school and resuming her career as a nurse. Things seemed to be going quite well in the relationship for quite some time. Joel was constantly posting photos of his wife and kids, always bragging to his friends and coworkers about how amazing his wife and kids were. But of course, behind closed doors, things between Maria and Joel were taking a turn for the worst. It was around 2018, right after Maria gave birth to her second son, Valentino, when people around Joel started to notice that he was changing. Suddenly, he lost a bunch of weight and started building muscle. He started getting a lot more friendly towards other women, flirting with them, and not necessarily acting like a married man. He started deleting photos of his wife and kids from social media. He started posting photos of just himself, not including his wife or children, kind of trying to make it seem like he was single on his social media. Then that same year, coworkers noticed that Joel was being extra friendly with one woman in particular, Janet, a surgical nurse who he met at work. All of a sudden, Joel and Janet started seeing each other and started a secret relationship behind Maria's back. You could say that Joel and Janet had a bit of a whirlwind romance. Over the course of two years, he took her on all sorts of vacations with one trip to Spain and another to France and Greece. Throughout that time, Maria always had a sneaking suspicion that her husband was cheating on her, but it wasn't until early 2020 that her suspicions were confirmed. That year, she actually found the airline tickets that he had purchased for himself and Janet to go to Europe. This sent Maria into a bit of a depression. She was obviously heartbroken when she found this out and was devastated that the marriage that she worked to build for 10 years was not what she thought it was. 
So she did start seeing a therapist who prescribed her some medication to help her with her mental health struggles. It was also around this time that she started journaling. Now, even after finding out about Joel's infidelity, Maria tried to believe in her marriage the best way that she could. In her journal, she wrote that despite everything she was going through, which was a lot, she still wanted to see Joel change. She wanted to see him work for their marriage, which he promised to do. A few months after he had gone to Europe with Janet, Joel took Maria to Las Vegas, showering her in gifts, even buying her a Louis Vuitton bag. Again, Joel was a nurse anesthetist, so he made pretty good money. For a while there, Maria really felt that maybe Joel could change for the better. But as you could have guessed, he didn't. Joel, to put it lightly, is a shitbag and continued seeing Janet behind Maria's back. By Saturday, September 19th, 2020, Maria drove past Janet's house and saw Joel's car parked in the driveway. So she stopped at the house, got out of the car, and rang Janet's doorbell to confront them. When Joel came out, Maria basically gave him an ultimatum, saying that he had to choose between her or Janet, and he told her that he chose Janet. As this confrontation was happening, Janet had called the police, but by the time police arrived, Maria and Joel had both left. Police then called Maria, who answered the phone as she was driving with Joel in the car next to her. On that call, police heard Joel berating Maria. Joel was heard saying to Maria, hey, I'm effing talking to you right now. Hang up the effing phone. The officer asked if that was her boyfriend in the background, and she said it was. By the time Maria and Joel got home, Joel had become so angry that he punched a hole in the windshield of Maria's car. That takes so much force and so much anger to punch a hole in a glass windshield like that. That is just insane. By the next morning, Sunday, September 20th, Maria sent Joel a text saying that she was going to hire a lawyer to figure things out. But Joel replied, saying that they needed to do this without lawyers intervening because getting a lawyer involved would cost too much money. But just a few hours after that text exchange, it seemed that Joel had a little bit of a change in heart. Joel sent Maria an email which said, I am so sad, I am hurting inside. I want to sit down with you to talk without arguing, a heart to heart. She messaged him back and they ultimately agreed to meet up at about 5 p.m. the following night, Monday, September 21st. Of course, Maria was nervous for this meeting. She didn't know what was going to happen. Would Joel agree to change and would he stay for the children or was he completely done with the relationship? Before Joel arrived, Maria sent a message to her friend Yasmin which said, I just ask if you can pray for me. Tonight, we are going to talk. Yasmin responded saying that she would pray for her. However, whatever prayers Yasmin said for Maria would unfortunately not be answered. In the early morning hours of September 22nd, 2020, 911 received a call from Joel Peyote, who was at home with Maria. He reported that his wife had taken some prescription pills and was not breathing. By the time police arrived to their home at around 1.40 a.m., police entered and immediately saw Joel at the top of the stairs near the main bedroom, still wearing a set of teal surgical scrubs, performing CPR on his wife as their two sons slept in the rooms nearby. As soon as first responders arrived, they took over CPR. As other first responders worked tirelessly to try and save Maria's life, another officer asked Joel about what pills she had apparently taken. Immediately, Joel went into a nearby bathroom and then went through the medicine cabinet and grabbed a bottle. He hands it to the officers and they see that it's a prescription for clonazepam. Clonazepam is a benzodiazepine drug used to help acute episodes of anxiety, panic attacks, and it can also be used to help treat epilepsy. For those of you who don't know, benzos slow the nervous system and can help calm you down, but they are known to be highly addictive, therefore they are highly regulated. On that bottle, the officer noticed that the pills had actually been prescribed to Joel, not Maria. Something else that stood out to officers was that the pill bottle was placed back in the medicine cabinet. 
Usually, when someone overdoses by taking pills, the pill bottle will still be out next to them. Yet, for some reason, apparently Maria had taken these pills and then put them back in the bathroom cabinet where they belonged. If Maria had taken those pills on her own, why would she have put them back? That is not normally something that someone would do if they were going to take pills to end their own life. But despite that, Joel told the officers that Maria had been struggling lately. She's been super depressed and that is why she had taken all those pills. For the two hours that followed after first responders arrived, they continued to work desperately to save Maria's life. However, their efforts were not enough. By 3.58 a.m. on September 22nd, 2020, Maria Munoz was pronounced dead in her home. As all of that was happening, other officers took Joel downstairs into the kitchen for further questioning. Joel told officers that on that day, he and Maria met up for their talk. Apparently, the two had sex and then Joel got into the shower afterwards. By the time he got out, he saw that Maria had fallen asleep. So, he went back downstairs for whatever reason. That really isn't explained. But once he came back upstairs and after getting closer to Maria, he realized that she was unresponsive and was not breathing. While he was talking to that other officer, the officer noticed that Joel was acting a bit odd and he looked a little bit off as well. He was profusely sweating and acting jittery and weird. The officer noticed that nobody else was sweating as much as he was, even the officers that had been trying to save Maria's life for two hours. And for those of you who have never done CPR, I've only done like the practice courses for CPR. I've never actually had to do it. But for those of you who have done it or have at least practiced it, it's very exhausting. So doing that for two hours, even when you are switching roles, that is absolutely exhausting. So the fact that Joel was profusely sweating and nobody else was, and the temperature in the house definitely wasn't the reason for him to be so hot, that really stood out to investigators. After that, police took Joel into the station for further questioning. Meanwhile, the other officers woke up the children and had to inform them of the awful, horrifying news of what happened to their mother. For the time being, they were in the care of law enforcement. At the police station, Joel had been sitting in the interrogation room by himself for a little bit before an officer joined him, but the entirety of his time in that interrogation room was recorded on videos. Officers saw that while Joel was alone in that room, he went into a rage. He was screaming, crying, hitting the walls, and throwing around furniture. He was being so loud that people in the nearby hall and other interrogation rooms were getting scared of what was going on in that room. By 4 a.m., an officer finally went into the room with Joel to speak with him. At that time, Joel once again explained that night and what led up to Maria's death. He actually admitted to officers that he was seeing another woman, Janet, and he said that he had actually moved out of the family home five months prior and was living with Janet at that time. He said that him and Janet had been together for two years at that point, with Maria knowing about the affair for quite some time. He said that on the night of Maria's death, he went to the family home to speak with Maria about their marriage. After that, again, the two apparently had sex and he saw Maria lying in her room thinking that she was asleep. He said that only 10 minutes passed before he went back to check on her and found her unresponsive. Joel admitted to the officer that he gave Maria that clonazepam that had been prescribed to him to calm her down because she had been dealing with a lot of anxiety and depression. However, he wasn't able to tell officers how much he had taken, how many pills were in the bottle before she got to them, nothing. He was able to give them pretty much no further information. At the same time, police were busy back at the home searching the crime scene for evidence. At the crime scene, police officers noticed a needle catheter on the stairs that was leading up to the second floor. They also found a medical bag in the home, and in that bag, they found multiple syringes as well as IV equipment. 
Now, of course, as we know, Joel, again, did work as a nurse anesthetist, so it made sense that he would have some medical equipment in his bag that he would bring home on a regular basis. However, what didn't make sense was why he would just leave an IV catheter lying on the stairs of their home knowing that they had two young children. Even though Joel wasn't living at the home at the time, he still should have been aware enough and had enough care for his children that he shouldn't be leaving out needles for his children to get into. Now, of course, after Maria was found dead in her home, her body was sent off to the medical examiner for an autopsy. The autopsy actually occurred only eight hours after her death, so it wasn't too long after her death, so whatever caused her to die should still be present within her stomach contents. The medical examiner determined that there was actually no residue of any pills within her stomach, meaning that it was unlikely that she had taken any pills before her death. It might have been dissolved prior to her taking it, like dissolved in coffee or a drink or something like that, but she did not physically take those pills shortly before her death. The next thing that the ME found was very concerning. They found a small red mark on Maria's right arm that looked to be sort of a pinprick. It looked exactly how it would look when you get your blood drawn at the doctor or if you get a shot or something like that, and it was in the right location too. Usually, when you get your blood drawn, it's taken from the elbow crease, and that's exactly where her mark was. At the end of the examination, Maria's cause of death was determined to be the result of mixed drug intoxication. At the time, however, it could not be determined how those drugs got into Maria's system, so the medical examiner waited for further investigative findings to figure out what Maria's final weeks and days were like. Nobody wanted to jump straight to assuming it was suicide because when you make that determination, even as a medical examiner, you still need to consider outside factors like what friends and family had to say, any past history of mental illness, past history of drug use, and things like that. As the ME awaited that part of the investigation, they did send off her blood work for further toxicology testing to determine exactly what was in her system. Again, they knew it was a mix of drugs, but weren't certain on which drugs specifically. Once friends and family found out about Maria's death, as well as what caused it, of course they were devastated, but nobody believed for a second that Maria would have taken her own life. Yes, she dealt with depression after finding out that her husband was being unfaithful. Anybody would be depressed when dealing with that, especially with how long they were married. But Maria loved life. She loved her children. She was going to therapy for her mental health struggles. She was finding ways to cope with her troubles, and there was no way that she would have just given up like that. As police continued their investigation, they found out that, as I mentioned earlier, Maria kept a journal of her thoughts and feelings to help her cope with her relationship problems. She also kept some secret recordings on her phone as well. They found one video that Maria took on her phone about four months before her death. I didn't get to watch the full video for myself, but I did see clips of it and read snippets of the conversation. So, in that video, Maria and Joel are sitting in the car together when Maria asks him what he wants out of their marriage. She asked him what he wanted her to do to keep the family together. And it doesn't seem like Joel is saying much or being very responsive. So Maria said, if you get out of this car, we are getting a divorce. So Joel, like a child having a hissy fit, gets out of the car and slams the door. Then police looked into Maria's journal where they found several entries where she wrote about her life, her husband, and what she wanted out of life. In one entry, she wrote about her fears. It says, quote, my fears are losing my family, losing my husband, damaging my kids, and making the wrong choice. In other entries, she wrote things like, Life is so unfair. My husband, the man I love so much, is causing me so much pain. I don't want to be sad anymore. I don't want my heart to hurt. I don't want my mind to be in torture. She also spoke about how she still had hopes for her marriage, saying that she wanted her marriage to be safe and she wanted her family to stay together. She wrote, Lord, this is a lot for me. 
All I really want to do is see change in him. There is another longer excerpt from Maria's journal saying, quote, my heart says one thing, my mind says something else. I am in this constant battle, tug of war. I want it to stop, but they won't. They keep me sad, and those are my tears. My future is foggy and unclear. My past haunts me. My present is confusing. Lord, hear me cry, see my tears, feel my pain, bring me laughter, bring me peace, bring me happiness again. I don't want to be sad anymore. I don't want my heart to hurt. I don't want my mind to be in torture. Please, I beg you, oh Lord. Just a few weeks before her death, Maria wrote in another entry, quote, so much pain, so much heartache that I have endured throughout these two years and nothing has changed. They keep getting worse. Honestly, don't know what's going to happen. As time progresses, I lose sight of us returning as a family. My kids are already hurting. God, please help me. I don't want to hurt anymore. Please, I beg you, make my situation change. I can't anymore, I swear. These are clearly words from a woman who is in pain, dealing with the constant torment of what her husband is putting her through. Her life is falling apart right before her eyes and there isn't anything she can do about it. I totally understand. This was an outlet for her, a very healthy way of expressing herself. And for some, that may be a clear sign that she was depressed and maybe she did want everything to end. But just one day before her death, she wrote in her journal about wanting to move forward. She finally seemed to be grappling with things and felt like things were looking up. On one page, she wrote, What's next? New beginnings. Where are you? In search for my happiness. A better tomorrow. This shows that she was starting to pick her head back up, that she knew she could get through this. She could get her life back together and become the best version of herself for her boys. So, based on what her friends had said about her, her mental health, and her relationship, the medical examiner and investigators pretty much ruled out a suicide. They did not think that she took her own life. But of course, to pin down exactly what happened, they would need to look further. After about four months of investigation, the medical examiner finally got the toxicology reports back. It was determined that Maria had actually no trace of clonazepam in her system. Again, that sort of made sense because when Joel went to show police the bottle of the pills that she had apparently taken, he grabbed it from the medicine cabinet as if it had been there the entire time. What they did find in her system, though, was concerning. They found a mix of seven drugs in Maria's system, including morphine, Demerol, Versed, Propofol, Ketamine, Lidocaine, and Narcan. For those of you who don't know, morphine, Demerol, and Versed, and Lidocaine are all medications used for pain management and can be administered via IV for anesthesia and pain control. Most of these medications also cause sleepiness and relaxation when administered. Propofol and ketamine are also used as sedatives and pain management. These are also administered via IV and are most commonly used for sedation when undergoing a surgical procedure. This is most of the time what your anesthesiologist will give you if you have ever undergone a medical treatment that puts you to sleep. If you've ever had a procedure like this done, you know that you have at least two to three people monitoring you while being given the general anesthesia because it is a very dangerous drug that has a lot of risks and it needs to be very closely monitored when it is being given. Propofol especially. Propofol slows your breathing and relaxes your entire body while it is being administered, but if you're given too much, it can cause you to stop breathing completely. Then the other drug found in her system was Narcan. That is a drug that is decently common and is carried by pretty much all first responders. It is used as a way to reverse opioid overdose. So, if a paramedic finds someone passed out on the side of the road or on the sidewalk or something, and their examination determines that they are most likely overdosing, they will use Narcan, which works by blocking the effects of the opioids on the brain and restores someone's breathing. It can be life-saving. Normal people cannot get their hands on most of these drugs. Even most nurses and other medical professionals will never be around these drugs, especially propofol and ketamine in particular, unless they are specifically working with anesthesiology. 
The drug propofol being in Maria's system is what shocked investigators the most. And again, as I will remind you, this is exactly what Joel does for a living. He is a nurse anesthetist, so he would have access to propofol. Based on that toxicology screen, there was one doctor who saw it who actually worked with Joel and worked with propofol with Joel. When he saw how much was in Maria's system, he said that that was the most that he has ever seen in someone's system. Based on this, this doctor strongly believed that her cause of death was the result of propofol specifically because again, he would know how much you need to give to calm someone down or to overdose them. And if you remember from earlier, there was that tiny mark on Maria's arm that indicated that she most likely was injected with something. We also saw that there was a syringe found in the home. Put two and two together and the picture becomes clear. It appears that Joel most likely gave Maria that propofol via injection. Throughout all of this, police did actually find and get a hold of Janet, the other woman who Joel was seeing while being married to Maria, the woman who he was living with just before Maria's death. Of course, she was shocked to find out that Joel's soon-to-be wife was dead, but she did not think that Joel actually murdered Maria. In her police interview, she told officers that he did often bring home drugs from work and kept them in the medical bag in their home. Things like ketamine, propofol, versed, and morphine. She also told police about what Joel told her about the night that Maria died. She said that Joel told her that he went over to Maria's house that night to have a heart-to-heart -heart about their relationship. She said that Maria started freaking out and actually told Joel that she needed help calming down, so Joel helped her calm down by giving her some medication. Most likely, he would have injected her with propofol. Then he told her that he did get rid of the medical equipment he used to inject her with the meds so that police wouldn't find out. But again, Janet said that Maria asked for this injection and she did not believe that Joel would have purposely killed Maria. However, by this point, again, investigators knew that she had a mix of several other sedatives in her system things that were not prescribed to her, nor would she have access to. If propofol was the only thing in her system, then it would be easier to believe that this was a horrible accident, but it wasn't. So, based on the toxicology screening, investigators believed that Joel actually slipped her several other sedatives, again, ketamine, versed, morphine, and Demerol, into her coffee, which she would have drank right up because she loved coffee. It's thought that those sedatives would have been enough for her to pass out and fall asleep. And then once she was asleep, that is probably when Joel would have injected her with a lethal dose of propofol. It was the belief of investigators that Joel then waited long enough to call 911 until he was confident that she was dead. He wanted to make sure that they wouldn't be able to bring her back. So after interviewing Joel and finding his behaviors after his wife's death to be very bizarre, after talking to friends and family of Maria's, and after getting that toxicology report back along with all of the other evidence that we've discussed up to this point, police believed that they had enough to arrest Joel for the murder of his wife as well as for charges of tampering with evidence. It wasn't until two years after Maria's death in March of 2023 that Joel finally went to trial for his wife's murder. The prosecution argued that Joel wanted his wife dead because she was getting in the way of his new relationship with this new woman. We can see through their many fights and negative interactions that Joel was a cheater with no remorse or care in the world while Maria tried to fight tooth and nail to save her family. We saw in those emails how Joel didn't want to get lawyers involved because he didn't want to spend the money. Divorce is a very, very expensive process. And given that Maria was a stay-at-home mother, if they did get divorced, there was a very high likelihood that he would be paying her alimony and or child support. 
They said that he had the means, the motive, and the opportunity to murder his wife. The prosecution highlighted the medical examiner's ruling that determined that Maria was not suicidal. Again, they determined this based on her recent journal entries as well as from statements from friends and family. They said that Joel had access to drugs at his work and he knew how to use them given that he was a nurse anesthetist. They also had Janet, Joel's now ex-girlfriend, testify at the trial as well. In her testimony, she talked about how Joel admitted that he injected Maria but not to kill her. He just wanted to calm her down. She talked about how he often brought various drugs home from work, so it was common for him to have access to these drugs and IVs to administer them. Also, if Maria was the one who took all those drugs on her own, where were the drugs? Why weren't they by her body when she was found? Again, normally, when someone takes their own life via overdose, you will find those pills right next to the person's body because chances are they're not going to take the pills and then calmly get up and put them away before going back and lying on the floor waiting for the pills to kick in. That just doesn't happen. You're going to take the pills and just lay there throw them next to you because you don't care what happens afterwards because you're trying to take your own life. You don't feel the need to put those pills nicely away in the cabinet after taking them. And if we want to say that Joel came in and cleaned them up after finding her, why did he do that? Why was that his first reaction and not, oh my god, my wife is overdosing, I need to do something right now? In the midst of things, why would he think to put those pills away? The defense, on the other hand, they conceded that there was no question that Joel was present when Maria died. However, they described that Maria was horribly depressed and had been drinking and abusing drugs for months to cope with her depression. They said that Maria often used Joel's drugs that she had access to because, again, he brought them home from work. They said that on the night of September 21st, 2020, when Joel arrived to her home, she had already taken prescription drugs on her own, but of course, she didn't tell Joel. She took those pills to prepare for the conversation so that she wouldn't freak out. But when they did have that heart-to-heart -heart conversation, she freaked out anyways, and Joel did give her that injection to calm her down. The defense does not deny that. They said that he only did this to calm her down, that he did not want to kill her. They actually said that when she went unconscious, he realized that she must have taken other drugs without his knowledge, so he administered Narcan. It was stated that someone had to have wanted to bring her back to life. The paramedics didn't give her Narcan, and neither did the police. The defense argued that Joel gave her Narcan because he didn't want her dead, that this was a horrible accident caused by all of those drugs that Maria had taken without Joel's knowledge. He didn't want to kill his wife, and that is proven by the fact that he tried giving her Narcan. However, the prosecution came back and said, you know, how do we know that Joel didn't just give her all these drugs and then when she died, he realized he went too far and that is actually why he tried giving her Narcan. Doesn't mean it was an accident, it could have been intentional, but he just regretted it afterwards. Then they also explained that if the only thing Joel gave her was propofol, then why would he give her Narcan in the first place? Narcan does not work with propofol. It works to reverse opioid overdose. So this is what I picture. Joel gave her that propofol injection to Maria. She passes out. He has no idea that she took opioids. At that point, as a medical professional, he's probably wondering if he gave her too much because why would she ask him to calm her down if she knew that she had already taken a cocktail of downers? Then we also have to remember that Maria is also a nurse. She may not have practiced in a few years, but she would know enough to know not to be taking propofol when she already took those other opioids. So again, why would Joel give Maria Narcan if the only drug in her system that he knew of was a drug that wouldn't respond to Narcan? Because again, if you injected someone with propofol, hoping to calm them down, and they passed out, as a medical professional, your first thought probably wouldn't be, oh, she must have taken other things prior to this. You would probably think, oh my god, I gave her too much. So why the Narcan? Because in my opinion, 
he knew that there was more than just propofol in her system. If he slipped her all of those opioids and then the propofol and immediately freaked out when he knew that he killed her, that would make sense why he tried Narcan. Because again, he knew that she could be saved if those opioids are reversed. Because again, if it was really just the mix of opioids that, you know, kind of took it over the edge and caused her to, you know, stop breathing, then the Narcan could possibly reverse that. But as we know, it didn't work because propofol is ultimately what killed her because of the lethal dose. He gave her way too much. In the trial, the defense really didn't have an explanation for what I just laid out. They didn't explain why he would have tried Narcan for propofol when he knew it wouldn't work. They also didn't explain how Joel would have accidentally given his wife a lethal dose of propofol given that he is a professional and he works with these drugs almost on a daily basis. Again, the amount of drugs in her system, it just could not have been an accident from someone who sees this every single day. They know how much drug each person should get based on their height and weight. They do this on a regular basis. They know how much to give and how much is too much. Again, we are talking about two nurses here. At least one of them has a very extensive knowledge of these medications and any nurse is going to have a, you know, decent understanding of these medications. An accident is pretty much out of the question for this. The prosecution also came back and said that there is no evidence that Maria ever abused drugs or alcohol. There was no alcohol in her system to begin with and no one in her life could point to a single time where they noticed that Maria was drunk or under the influence of anything. Then Maria's prosecution team read aloud many of Maria's journal entries, especially the ones written just before her death. She was looking up. She was ready to move on with her life. She was ready to begin the next chapter. She wasn't suicidal. She was motivated. She wanted nothing more but to be an amazing mother to her children. Her team said that her journals were possibly the most important part of the case. Reading through it not only allowed her team, but the jury and her loved ones to understand what she went through, how deeply it affected her, and how she was about to overcome all of it. It was almost like Maria was there to testify at her own trial and see the person who murdered her be held accountable. Again, the prosecution said that the motive was money. Joel simply didn't want to pay for the divorce. He didn't want to pay his wife for child support and alimony. He just wanted to be done with her and the kids and the whole life he was currently living. So, he thought that he could outsmart everyone and try to make it look like his wife overdosed. The prosecution said, quote, She wasn't a piece of paper. She was a human being. His wife loved him dearly, and he took advantage of that. She continued, He wanted a single life. He chose Janet. Maria was going to get out of the marriage. After both sides made their closing arguments, after nine days of trial, the jury went into deliberations. And by March 30th, 2023, the jury found that Joel Peyote was guilty for the murder of his wife, as well as for tampering with evidence when he tried to cover his tracks. For this, he was given a sentence of life in prison for the murder, as well as an additional 10 years plus a $10,000 fine for tampering with evidence. So, that is where the case sits right now. Of course, her family and friends are devastated with the loss. They said that Maria was the absolute best mother and the best wife. She loved Joel so deeply and he took advantage of that. He used the love she still had for him to get her alone to talk and made the decision to take her life rather than just facing the consequences for what he did. He is the cheater. He chose to leave his wife. All of this happened because of Joel and his selfishness and Maria continuously had to pay over and over and over again before she paid the ultimate price and it's just devastating. Through the research I have done, I have not been able to find what happened with Maria and Joel's children, but I am hopeful that they ended up with family who loved them and are raising them to the best of their ability. 
I just hope that those kids are loved and are being supported through everything that they have gone through. They lost both of their parents in the most horrific way possible, so I just hope that they're able to make it out of this okay. But that is all I have for today's case. This case was definitely a tough one because again, all Maria wanted to do was love. She gave so much love to Joel, who obviously didn't deserve it, and he just took advantage of that and put her through so freaking much before he killed her. My heart absolutely shatters for her, her family, her children, and everyone else who loved her. But that is all I have for today's case, and now I want to know what you all think. Do you agree with the verdict here? Do you think that Joel purposely killed his wife or was it an accident? Let me know this and any other thoughts that you have in the comments below. If you like this video, please make sure to go ahead and leave this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. I put out new true crime and mystery videos every single week. Don't forget to turn the notification bell to on so you don't miss out on any of my future videos. Make sure you follow my Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, and TikTok. All will be linked down below. And if you have any case suggestions, please make sure to fill out the Google form, which is also listed down below. With that, I hope you guys have an amazing week. Stay safe, stay healthy, and I hope to see you next time.